All right, thanks everyone for coming tonight. And uh, welcome to Liberty Me. We're here tonight with Sheldon Richmond. He's going to be talking about the American founding. This is the first in a two-part lecture series on the American founding. Tonight we're going to be talking about uh, the period from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution and kind of comparing those as well. Uh, Sheldon Richmond is Vice President of the Future of Freedom Foundation. He's the editor of their monthly journal, Future of Freedom, and he's the former editor of The Freeman. He's written on foreign policy, population issues, uh, disaster assistance, American history, privacy, the Middle East, and just about anything else you can think of. Uh, and so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sheldon. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Matt, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending. I hope this is, uh, will be interesting, provocative. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll speak for just enough time, I think, to provoke uh, Q&A discussion. And I hope, hope we can have a good, lively one. Uh, I do want to talk about the Constitution, but I want to build up to the Constitution. So I'll be covering uh, surrounding historical events, uh, the Revolution being one of them, uh, and the Articles of Confederation, which is actually the first U.S. Constitution. It's not known by that name. Uh, but it, you need to understand that in order to fully uh, appreciate uh, uh, the meaning of the uh, of the of the the U.S. Constitution. Now, there's one thing I want to warn against is is what uh, has, is known as the Whig theory of history. That's W H I G, uh, which is a view that libertarians I think do fall prey to at least up to one, uh, some point in history, where they think that um, the uh, the general trend is toward improvement of political institutions and. Uh, and, and other things. Uh, for libertarians, this may stop at the progressive era, but uh, before then, there's this sense that um, things are sort of getting better and better. And this, in one way, this is imp uh, applied is with the uh, Articles of Confederation versus the Constitution. In other words, this is there's this idea that uh, there's sort of a law of history that uh, the the bad and uh, gets uh, left by the wayside, and what uh, continues onward are, are are good are the good elements. Uh, in any particular uh, institution or uh, whatnot. So to apply this to the, to the uh, Articles of Confederation, the idea is, uh, and this is pretty standard view in, in, uh, in, in, by, among historians, that the Articles were a failure and that there was this uh, inexorable uh, move toward uh, the next stage, which was the Constitution, which is, is uh, then regarded by definition as an improvement over the Articles. After all, if the Articles were so good, they wouldn't have been replaced by the Constitution. Uh, now, people don't often state it maybe that bluntly, but I think a lot of people, and including a lot of libertarians, uh, take that view. And I want to uh, cast some doubt on that. After all, there aren't laws of history. As, uh, as in methodological individualists and advocates of uh, free will, libertarians uh, uh, believe uh, that, um, that uh, history is the result of uh, human action. Individuals act. In the face of alternatives, they have preferences, they have values, they have interests, and those are the kinds of things that they are uh, attempting to uh, to uh, achieve when they make uh, various choices. And this happens in the political realm just as much. So we can't look at the the move from the Articles to the Confe uh, to the Constitution as if it were some sort of uh, you know locomotive of history just heading down the track in inexorably. Or human uh, human decisions being made uh, all along the way. Now, another thing I want to point out, is sort of as a, a preface about the Constitution, is that it's claimed by uh, people of a wide variety of political views. I mean, almost anybody on the political scene will will pay homage to the uh, to the Constitution and claim uh, to uh, 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 lo love it. I mean, it's be it's beloved by all sorts of people. Uh, and these people, of, of course, uh, depending on their own political views, uh, give the. Uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do there, was it? Give the uh, a, a different meaning depending on what their political views are. And there's this uh, easy uh, temptation to read values backward into the Constitution to find the values you want to find. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of like a, an ink blot or uh, or a scripture. You can kind of find what you want. Um, Two people who this was said about uh, are uh, Thomas Jefferson and, and Alexander Hamilton. The historian Merrill Jensen, who I'll be referring to uh, during my remarks, a very good historian of the period, uh, 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 period around the Articles of Confederation, uh, said the following. 
He says, once it was adopted, meaning the Constitution, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, with two opposed ideas of what the United States uh, should be, laid down two classic and contradictory opinions of the nature of the Constitution. The two basic interpretations may be stated. Jefferson held that the central government was sharply limited uh, by the letter of the Constitution, that in effect the states retained their sovereign powers except where they were specifically delegated. Hamilton argued, in effect, that the central government was a national government which could not be restrained by a strict interpretation of the Constitution or by ideas of state sovereignty. Uh, now, I think uh, you'll recognize the libertarian position in this, this summary of Jefferson's view of the Constitution, you know, that it, uh, it's, it's sharply limited the, uh, uh, the powers of the uh, central government and, and therefore left the states uh, with their so-called sovereign powers. And Hamilton is generally seen by, by libertarians as, a, uh, you know, as, a, as the, one of the bad guys of American history. Uh, the interesting thing I want to point out about this is that, don't forget, uh, Hamilton and Jefferson were having their clash at a time when the, the ink on the, parch uh, the parchment was barely dry. So they, at, uh, at least at some of the some time, couldn't agree on what this document meant, even though it was that fresh. I mean, it had only recently been written and circulated and, and voted on, debated at length, as you know, and then eventually ratified. And those two guys had very different views of what it meant. Now, you know, we may, we may like what Jefferson came up with, but how do we know Jefferson was right? And why would Hamilton necessarily be wrong? What is it about the Constitution that uh, that allows for this kind of uh, disagreement? I think that's. I want to try to shed some light on that. So let's uh, first uh, go back before even the Articles of Confederation, just to create to set a little bit of historical uh, context here. Uh, in the colonies, we see a manifestation of what's known as the Iron Law of Oligarchy, which. Which, uh, which means that, you know, in, 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 any, in any organization, society, even a small, you know, club, a, a t typically a relatively small group, a small subset of the entire group, uh, sort of gravitates toward the governance of the, of the group. Uh, there will always be a relative few who are sort of most interested in taking a hand in the day-to-day the -day, uh governance of whatever it is, whether it's a society or a social club. Uh, mo most people are busy making a living, raising families, doing all the, taking care of the various, you know, cares of the day, uh, day in and day out, and uh, don't have the time or inclination to be as involved as this small group will tend to be. So that's, that's, just, that's just known in sociology as the iron law of oligarchy, or oligarchy and it applied to, the, to each of the colonies. In each of the colonies, over time, an elite emerged that tended to uh, have its hand most firmly in the in the governance of that colony, and so the and the elites differed culturally from from uh, colony to colony, depending on the region. In the South, the, the the elites tended to be the major planters, right, the owners of the plantation, the large plantations. Uh, outside the South, it tended to be the merchants, and perhaps the law uh, people involved in the law, and their positions became entrenched over over time, just the way we'd expect. I mean, this is just the way it works uh, uh, in many many places and, and uh, many times. So, all, you know, all times, I suppose. Uh, and so, vested interests become formed, and the people who are outside or who are excluded, and in the, and don't forget, in the colonies, uh, uh, people who didn't own Property did not have the same advantages as people who did own property. And uh, so there were sort of ins and outs, and that creates rivalries and resentments. And on the part of the outs, it, can, it, it does, it does uh, uh, create a, a desire for change and even fundamental change. So in other words, you had a group, uh, two groups that Jensen calls the conservatives on the, on the one hand, or you may also think of it think of them as the Democrats, and the radicals, on the other hand, uh, as we, we may think of as the, uh, the Democrats, be, be in the sense of being anti-aristocracy. 
there were aristocracies in, throughout the colonies. Uh, and of course, the, the background of their power was, uh, was the, the, the crown, okay, the, as part of the British uh, uh, monarchy. So this leads Jensen to observe that when, when revolution was in the air, and of course it was, a, it was an intellectual revolution before it became a, a, a military conflict, uh, there were internal and external aspects to this revolution. Externally, you have the radicals first, first uh, who, who, who want to break away from the, and be independent of the, uh, the British Empire. But that went hand in hand for them with a, their desire for an internal revolution to break the whole of the aristocracies in the various colonies and, and to have a more decentralized, democratic, we might even think of as a populist uh, approach. This was not purely libertarian. I'm not making that claim. Uh, they may have been more libertarian than their opponents, but that didn't mean they, they didn't want government to be rather active at the, at the local level. That's sort of a different issue. So you have these two revolutions really going on at once, internal and external. The radicals are for uh, breaking from the British uh, uh, Empire uh, first. They first propose it. And by and large, the conservatives are against it because they feel that's the source of their power and they feared they would lose it or it would be eroded or badly diminished if they did not have the backing of the, uh, of the British. Uh, but over time, the conservatives come around to the independence position because of the various abuses inflicted by, uh, by King George, uh, arbitrary power, you know, closing of the Port of Boston, the intolerable acts, interference with trade, things of that nature, uh, stamp tax, uh, stuff like that. And so the, the, the conservatives end, end up becoming pro uh, independence so they join the radicals to that extent but they certainly don't join the radicals over the issue of breaking the internal uh, aristocracy and so in fact the the conservatives uh, switched their program from maintaining membership in the empire because it helped to maintain their power to breaking from the empire and recreating the power without British backing uh, at home Re recreate it with them being fully in charge and not even having to answer to a royal governor or uh, some other uh, royal authority. <clears throat> so it, uh, it was a desire to replicate the British political economy, which was a mercantilist economy, of course, uh, with, them, with them in charge. <clears throat> so for, for the conservatives, not necessarily, not for the, uh, well, not necessarily for the radicals, it's not, it's a little uh, uh, complicated there, but for the conservatives, the revolution was seen, at least in part, as a battle between what they saw as a mature empire, the Brits, and a rising empire, or what George Washington called an infant empire, namely the what would be the United States. Okay, so that's that's the that's the background. Now, there's a Continental Congress, right? There's uh, two Continental Congresses uh, where the states have sent uh, delegates, and uh, they decide to. Uh, draft a, uh, uh, the Articles of Confederation, uh, which would be this loose uh, association of these uh, uh, soon-to-be states. They were, they were still uh, colonies at the time in preparation. War was going on. Let me uh, bring up a timeline here that will uh, make this uh, more clear. So let's see. Oh, that's backwards. There we go. So here is uh, our timeline. Whoops, I've got to get this thing out of the way. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we have the Articles of Confederation being adopted by the Second Continental Congress uh, on that date, November 15, 1777. So the, the war is on. The Articles were being drafted in the, in the Continental Congress. Uh, while the, at the same time that the uh, Declaration of Independence was being drafted and debated. So this is all going on at the same time. Uh, the Articles then take effect after ratification by the, by the uh, 13 colonies, uh, soon to be states, in March of uh, 1781. Uh, Cornwallis surrenders in October of uh, 1781. So you can see 
that there's some time. The, the articles are actually adopted while the war is still going on. Treaty of Paris isn't signed till two years later, 1783. Uh, and then just to jump now, the, the in 1787, and I'll get into this in more detail, the Continental Congress calls for a convention to revise the articles. I stress that word, revise. I'll talk about that. And then in uh, 1787, the uh, Federal Convention, or what was known as the General Convention, what we call it the Constitutional Convention, uh, begins. At, in September of that year, it's, the Constitution's approved and the convention adjourns. It then goes to the states for ratification, and by March 4th of 1789, the uh, Constitution takes effect. The Bill of Rights is then adopted as amendments to the Constitution by the first uh, Congress in uh, 1791. So, let's talk about the, the uh, Articles of Confederation. What did they have in mind? Well, there wasn't a whole lot of support back then for anything more than a relatively loose uh, confederation, which is why it's called the Articles of Confederation. So, there wasn't strong support for a, uh, a, a big national government, which would, by nature, de-emphasize the states. Uh, there was an attempt at this. Uh, John Dickinson, a Pennsylvania delegate, uh, member of uh, Congress, uh, drafts a, an article, a, a, a proposed articles, which would have had a fairly strong central government with an executive committee, not a single president, but an executive committee uh, ruling and then a, and a, and then a, a Congress. Uh, so it, this, uh, this discussion of uh, what kind of confederation uh, there should be begins with, a, with uh, Dickinson's strong bid for a strong central government. Uh, however, he's turned back. He's turned back by a, a member of Congress by the name of Thomas Burke, who had su enough support to, uh, to win the day. And he proposes an amendment which cr ends up creating what, what it is that they got, which was a very weak uh, central government, if we want to call it that for the moment, I would call it a quasi-government, uh, and the states, uh, basically, uh, the colonies, which would become states, uh, with uh, as, as essentially sovereign uh, individual states that were just uh, in this league of, with other states, uh, but yet, but not, but had not surrendered uh, its own sovereign powers. Uh, it would still maintain. Uh, uh, really total power to govern internally and only external or what they called uh, general considerations would be uh, turned over to this uh, that national uh, to this national government uh, the key bring up a slide here the key article that, that uh, made sure it uh, went things the way it went the way Burke wanted it to go rather than uh, uh, Dickinson wanted it Is, is this Article 2, which is very important because they're going to compare it to language in the, uh, in the Bill of Rights. It'll, it seems to resemble language you may be familiar with. Uh, but note the strength of this Article 2 of the Articles of Confederation. Each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, let me uh, enlarge that, jurisdiction and right, which is uh, by, not by this confederation expressly delegated uh, to the United uh, States in Congress assembled. So this is, uh, this is critical to the, uh, to, this is what made the Articles of Confederation really what they, uh, what they were. The, the fact that it, it, it boldly declared that each state re, uh, retains its uh, sovereignty. <clears throat> So two things are, are also worth noting about the Articles of Confederation. Two things that are that are absent from the Articles, uh, as opposed to this, uh, which is present. The Articles of Confederation did not give the national, what I'm calling quasi-government, the power to tax. No power to tax whatsoever, and no power to regulate trade in any way. It's not mentioned. Uh, uh, that's pretty significant, I think, from a, from a libertarian standpoint, that there was this creation of a government that had neither the power to tax nor the power to, uh, uh, to regulate trade. So the reason I wanted to call it a, a quasi-government is I'm not sure it can be really a government if it doesn't have the power to tax. 
it seems to me the power to tax is an essential uh, quality. It's an essence of government. Without that, I don't think you have government. Now, I call it a quasi-government because it did get its money through taxation, but it got it through the state's power to tax. So it had to requisition money from the states, and the states, of course, could use the power to tax. So it was like a second-order power of taxation, but it had no direct power of taxation. Uh, that's pretty significant. And also the power to, uh, to, uh, to, to not, uh, no power to say anything about trade. That's, that also is... Uh, I don't know that there's another government anywhere that, that lacked that power. Now, if we step back for a second, we might want to say, uh, as libertarians, we might want to say, you know, when they dumped this document, which I'll talk about, what the heck were they thinking? They dumped a, they dumped a system where the central government, quote unquote, could neither tax them nor regulate their trade. Why didn't they leave well enough alone? Even if there were some problems, figure out how to work them out. But why the backslide? See, that's a, that seems to me as a backslide, contrary to the Whig notion that it's always onward and upward, improvement, constant improvement. That doesn't seem like an improvement. Libertarians certainly shouldn't regard it as an improvement. I guess there are statists who would regard it as an improvement. Uh, but we should not regard it as an improvement. So that's, uh, that's a little uh, bizarre. <clears throat> now... Like I said, the, the Articles of Confederation was pretty bare bones. There were there were some there were powers, more powers than even I'd like. Uh, post office, for example, uh, but uh, but uh, there there uh, wasn't a lot to work with. However, there were people in the Congress who um, who thought maybe more power would be uh, useful. Uh, James Madison, who was in this uh, Second Continental Congress when the uh, Articles took effect, <clears throat> was one of those people who thought there should be more of a central government, a strong central government. He, he was not alone. And uh, these people made various proposals over the years to uh, bolster the power. First of all, they tried to find powers, implied powers, in the, in the, uh, in the Articles of Confederation. <clears throat> they didn't have a whole lot of luck. They tried, didn't get them any, anywhere. Then they would propose amendments <clears throat> sometimes. <clears throat> so, Jeff, so Madison... Madison proposed an amendment in 1781 where he, claimed, where he said a general and implied power is vested in the United States in Congress assembled to enforce and carry into effect all the articles of the said confederation against any of the states which shall refuse or neglect to abide by such determinations. See, sometimes the states weren't being cooperative. They wouldn't send in the money or they wouldn't go along with something else that the... Uh, that the Congress wanted to do. So here's Madison attempting to, uh, and, and there wasn't much the, uh, uh, the Congress could do about that. So, so Madison is trying to remedy that by uh, putting in language in the articles that declared that there was a general and implied power. Those are his words. Now, it's very interesting. I want you to pay attention to that term, implied power, because that, that's going to come back, and it, 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 we need to uh, hold... Madison's interest in implied powers uh, up against his reputation for being against implied powers. He's the guy that said the powers of the U.S. Uh, government are few and defined, according to the Constitution. When he was trying to sell the Constitution and the Federalist, he claimed they were few and defined. And yet, on more than one occasion, he's arguing for implied powers. So I, I believe that Madison, contrary to what conservatives believe, at Madison is the father of the implied powers doctrine, which conservatives hate so much, and, and we should hate, because you can find, if you, if you, that doctrine then permits almost anything to be found in it, almost any language, if you try hard enough. Uh, so I think Madison is the culprit. All right, so uh, there were also attempts to give the, the, uh, uh, the, Fed, the national government some uh, modest taxing power, like a 5% uh, tariff. Uh, and there was some support for that in Congress, and a couple of times that amendment got sent out to the uh, states for ratification, and it would fail because one state could hold it up. You see, we needed unanimous consent for any change in the articles. Very important point. Keep that in mind. I'll be coming back to that. Okay. Uh, finally, the centralizers, and there's, there's centralization, uh, there's a centralization movement going on uh, in the country. Uh, the, the country was not made up of entirely of decentralists, 
libertarian types, populists, or wh whatever you want to call them, there was a move among, uh, usually among the major uh, economic powers, the merchants, and like I say, the, the major planters, uh, to uh, come up with a stronger central government. They did not like that the United States, and it was called the United States then, under the Articles, was not truly a nation. Because, you know, in their view, how can you be a nation if there's not a strong head that can have a tax policy, can have a trade policy, and other kinds of policies? They didn't like that it was just a loose confederation. Uh, they, figure, figure, they thought the United States, they could not accomplish their objectives, and the United States could not be a big leaguer, uh, you might have said, uh, with, with this pitiful quasi-government created by the Articles Confederation. So there's a move to call a convention to amend uh, the Articles. And that does gain steam. And finally, a convention is called for Philadelphia in 1787. But it's for the purpose of amending the Articles. And I stress that. Now, under the rules, you could, if you amend the Articles, any amendment has to go out to the states and has to have unanimous consent. One, one uh, state could could hold things up. Uh, so the delegates gather in Philadelphia. There are centralizers there. There are decentralists there. Hamilton and Madison are the leading uh, centralists. Uh, Jefferson, who might have been a, a vocal decentralizer, was in Paris at the time. So he's not at the, at the uh, general convention. <clears throat> uh, one of the arguments made for strengthening the government while the revolution was still on was that um, the, uh, how, how are we going to win the war unless we have more power? But as the war was beginning to wind down and as, and as success, to, success was in view, the centralizers began to panic because they thought we're going to lose this great argument. You know how even today war is used, war is the health of the state. Well, they knew that back then, even if they had never heard, of, heard uh, Randolph Bourne's uh, uh, a great uh, adage, <clears throat> but they did worry that with the uh, the end of the war, the immediacy of uh, of the need to give uh, this this national government the power to tax and, and other powers was going to uh, fade. In fact, Robert Morris, who's a, a centralizer, a centralist, and a uh, one of the financiers of the uh, American Revolution, said said this amazing amazing thing. He said, "A continuance of the war is necessary." until we acquire the habit of paying taxes. So that's uh, the sort of thing that was on the mind of, uh, of, of, of what would, be, would come to be, be known as the, the, the Federalists, the group that wanted a strong uh, central government. OK, so they get to Philadelphia. And you, have, you do have this mix of delegates. No one side dominates and can dictate. Uh, but the, the Federalists, uh, the, the centralizers, uh, seem to be to have some edge in the strength of it. Uh, <clears throat> the working uh, model that they, that they begin with is uh, Madison's Virginia Plan. And Madison's Virginia Plan was essentially what came out of the Constitution. I mean, there were, uh, came out of the Convention, the Constitution we know. Uh, yes, there was some compromising uh, of the language, some things that were more vague than maybe the centralizers would have wanted in order to satisfy the decentralists uh, and, and the people uh, outside uh, who would have to eventually uh, vote on this in, the, in their ratifying conventions. Uh, but they stuck to their, uh, basically stuck to this plan, which created a muscular, certainly compared to the Articles of Confederation, a muscular uh, um, central government and, um, and by necessity, uh, weaker states. So I want to uh, just compare a little bit of text. I don't want to take up uh, all the time because I really do want time for uh, uh, discussion. But let me um, let's see. do some. I'm going to do some textual comparison here so you can get a sense of the of the flavor. Uh, we've already seen this uh, this Article Two of the. Uh, of the um, Articles of Confederation, this very important Article 2. Uh, each state retains its sovereignty. I want to highlight uh, an aspect of this in red so, so I can call attention to, to very, two key uh, points in this Article 2 of the Articles of Confederation. 
Notice it says each state retains its sovereignty, and uh, every power not by this confederation expressly delegated. It doesn't say delegated, but expressly delegated. That means it has to has to state that the power is delegated. Uh, you know, is um, is re is retained uh, by the states. Uh, so let's compare that. Now, no, there's no. Let me back up a step. There's no. There is no language like that in the Constitution. Nothing like that. Now, if that reminds you of anything, it reminds you of uh, uh, the Tenth Amendment, which of course was not part of the Constitution. It was part of the Bill of Rights, which the, te the first ten amendments adopted after the Constitution was already ratified, had, had gone into effect, and the, and the first Congress um, had met. So, remember, the Constitution itself, as first presented to the people of the new United States and to the states ratifying conventions, did not have anything like the language of this Article 2 of the, of the uh, Articles Confederation. Uh, that's something that upset some ratifiers. Uh, you know, they said, well, some of them did say, and the people at large, <coughs> you know, why isn't there a Bill of Rights? Why isn't there some declaration of, uh, of the state's uh, powers? And, uh, and so you get a lot of writing back and forth about the problems with the Constitution. Uh, and you, as you know, the, the Federalist Papers are the most famous collection of these. These are uh, writings in defense of the Constitution and in favor of ratification by James Madison, by Alexander Hamilton, and to a lesser extent by um, John Jay. <coughs> uh, on the other side, you have people who are critical of the Constitution, become known as the Anti-Federalists, who are writing in newspapers. The, the uh, Federalist Papers are originally newspaper columns. They only later got compiled into a book. <coughs> but the people who we call the Anti-Federalists did this similar things, writing in the different state papers, uh, picking away at the Constitution, saying there's a problem with this, there's a problem with that. I'll, I'll go uh, over their, some of their objections um, pretty soon. But what I'm going to do here is uh, sort of uh, jump ahead to uh, the, uh, the, the uh, centralist Madison's attempt to remedy uh, or satisfy the people who complained that there was no, there was no Article II uh, like this in the, Const in the Constitution, Article II as it appears in the Articles of Confederation. There, so there is an attempt uh, to, um, oops, let me get to my slide here. In, our, in the 10th, uh, what became the 10th Amendment to the uh, United States Constitution, let me, let me go back one. Okay. Okay. Uh, it was originally actually the 12th Amendment. The, uh, the Congress reported out 12 amendments, only 10 got ratified. So what was 12 then became the 10th. Uh, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or prohibited to it uh, by the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Now this, is a, uh, this 10th Amendment is, uh, the, uh, is uh, often emphasized by conservatives and other, con other constitutionalists as, uh, as uh, claiming that... Uh, you know, not all the powers were delegated to the central government, and the states still retain uh, sovereignty. So, uh, they, you know, there's, there's therefore people defending nullification, secession, and, uh, and whatnot on the, on the basis of the Tenth Amendment. But I want you to notice how weak that, that language is compared to the, the language of the Articles. The Articles did talk about sovereignty, and it did talk about uh, uh, expressly uh, uh, delegated powers. In particular, oops. The missing the missing piece is when you compare it to the articles of Article Two of the Articles of Confederation is we don't have the word expressly before de delegated, and we have the word reserved, not retained. Now that may seem like a small thing, but it isn't really. As it's been pointed out, I have this little slide here. Retained suggests that something that you already have is kept. Okay, so it said the, the the states retain their powers. Reserved does not necessarily mean th these were pre-existing powers. 
They're just and the Tenth Amendment says that anything not delegated to the United States, namely the national government, uh, is is reserved to the states. So it doesn't have the same meaning that the pre-existing powers of the states are retained, uh, except for a couple of powers given to the central government. It seems to say that um, pa any powers not delegated are reserved to the states. But that leaves open the whole question of what's delegated uh, and what's not delegated. That is not a clear-cut, uh, easily answered question. And, and Madison and Hamilton did not believe the Constitution answered it. They believed that would be worked out in the political arena in the, in the coming years. They did not think they had answered these questions about what pay powers were left to the states and, and what was delegated to the uh, to the. Uh, national government. And it's not true they thought that they they said, but they, it's clear that they didn't really believe that everything, that, that the only powers the national government could exercise are, the, are ones that are expressly stated. I mean, I hear people say this all the time, that the federal government may not exercise any power not expressly uh, enumerated in the Constitution. They did not really believe that. It's clear. Because for, just take an example. How about the power of eminent domain? Now, the, notice that it, uh, if you go to the Bill of Rights, the Fifth Amendment says that the, uh, refers to eminent domain in the following way. It says, nor may private property be taken for public use without just compensation. But that's the first mention anywhere of the power of eminent domain, which means it was an implied power in the Constitution itself, and the Fifth Amendment was just adding some limit to it. So there's an implied, there was a power that was uh, definitely uh, meant to be implied. And there were other such powers as well. <clears throat> okay, so here's an interesting story. While the, the Tenth Amendment was being debated, or what was the Twelfth, was being debated in Congress, first in committee and then in the Congress of the whole, uh, a representative from South Carolina named Thomas Tudor Tucker rose to amend the amendment. He proposed that the word expressly be placed in the in in Madison's uh, language to say powers not expressly delegated to the United States by the Constitution, etc., are reserved uh, to the states respectively or to the people. But but uh, Madison would have none of that. Madison opposed that, and according to the record, he argued that it was impossible to confine a government to the exercise of express powers. There must necessarily be admitted powers by implication, unless the Constitution descended to recount uh, every minutia. In other words, Madison, Madison was saying we cannot place the word expressly before delegated, as it was in the Articles, uh, because that would limit the national government only to express powers, and that's ridiculous. Any Constitution has to have implied powers, or else you'd have to have this endless list of every little power it has. Once again, uh, uh, confirming my assertion that Madison is the father of, uh, of the implied powers uh, doctrine. <clears throat> so conservatives need to understand that Madison is not really their friend. He, he, he seems to have been the, uh, the root of uh, so much of what they complain about uh, today. Well, OK, I'm going on too long. Uh, Needless to say, this uh, Constitution was uh, was um, uh, ended up being approved by the uh, the convention. Uh, but an interesting thing was added to the at the end. As I told you, to amend the uh, the, the Articles of Confederation, you needed the unanimous consent of the states. Okay, it had to be unanimous. But these guys didn't amend the the, con the Articles. When they got to Philadelphia, they locked the door, so the public couldn't watch what was going on, and they tore up the Articles. And they started from scratch, Madison's uh, plan, Madison's Virginia plan. And then at the end of the, of, of, the, of the Constitution, of the proposed Constitution, they set new rules for adoption. Instead of unanimous consent, they said that states, through special conventions, not through state uh, legislatures, through special ratifying conventions, only nine would have to ratify in order for the Constitution to take effect. So they changed the rules. Albert J. Nock, the great libertarian, author of a great book, 1935 book, uh, called uh, Our Enemy the State, uh, calls this the coup d'etat, Philadelphia coup d'etat. Uh, and uh, I don't know, he seems to, uh, he seems to have, uh, have a good point there. So 
it then goes out for ratification, but you have this group known as the Anti-Federalists who come along and they start complaining. They, they start issuing complaints. They argue that uh, the preamble, we the people, they thought this was supposed to be a confederation of states. Why does it say we the people? They complained that the taxing power was open-ended and comprehensive and extremely dangerous. These, were say, these people were saying this at the time. Compare what they're saying to what, how history has developed and tell me whether you think the Anti-Federalists were onto something. They thought the taxing power was wide open, that the government, the Congress could basically tax anything and in any manner. They thought the general welfare clause was, again, you could drive a Mack truck. They didn't have Mack trucks in those days, but you could drive a horse and carriage through. They thought the necessary and proper clause was a blank check. They thought the supremacy clause, supremacy clause was similar. They thought the federal government's ability to grab control of the militia was dangerous, that it would lead to a standing peacetime army. They thought there were ambiguities in, in implied powers. They thought it was needless, needlessly complex. They were, in my view, they were prophets. I think their predictions of what would happen uh, came true. The, the, the uh, Constitution was ratified. There was some hanky-panky in the states about ratification, which I can't go into. Eventually, it's ratified. The Constitution is, uh, uh, goes into effect. Uh, we have uh, George Washington as the first president under the Constitution, and as they say, the rest is history. Uh, however, I would like to end on the note uh, of, uh, by uh, Lysander Spooner, the great abolitionist uh, uh, who uh, wrote a, uh, an essay I recommend to you called No Treason, the Constitution of No Authority, that he said, whatever the Constitution may be, this is a loose, uh, loose uh, quotation, whatever the, make, the Constitution may be, one thing is certain. Either it authorized the government we have or it was powerless to prevent it. In either case, it's unfit to exist. So I think I've spoken enough or more than enough, and uh, let's have questions and conversation. Uh, thanks so much. This has been great already. Um, I'm, uh, as some people uh, may notice, uh, stealing Jeff Tucker's office right now. But if you'd like to ask a question, you can uh, click the questions tab on the right and then uh, ask a question in text there. Or if you'd like to um, ask a question on video, you can <laughs> click chatting in the upper right above the chat window, and then click start your webcam, and I can bring you on screen. Um, all right, uh, Stephen Kintella brought up uh, an interesting point in the chat down here. Uh, he said that uh, he said this was great, and that you changed your uh, changed his mind on a lot of this. However, he disagrees that there's a Fifth Amendment uh, implication. Uh, of the power of eminent domain. Uh, so uh, he says the, you know, the Bill of Rights was not a grant of power, but limitations on federal power. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I th I'm not sure we're differing. It seems to me if, if you say just out of the blue, and not in the Constitution even uh, proper, but in an amendment, that the, uh, you can't, the, the federal government can't take uh, uh, private property without just, for public use, without just compensation, it's putting a limit on an implied power because there's the power of eminent domain is not specified in the Constitution. So what the heck is the Fifth Amendment talking about? It assumes there's power to take uh, pro uh, private property, but it's now placing limits on it in case there's any misunderstanding, right? It's got to be for public use, although we know what happened to that language over the years, right? They've taken private uh, property for uh, shopping malls and uh, industrial parks, parks, and it, there has to be just compensation. So it was limiting a power, but the power is not specified anywhere, so therefore it was limiting an applied power. I, I'm not sure I'm disagreeing with Stefan. He says in chat that the, you know, the Ninth Amendment uh, specifies the enumeration of rights, that the enumeration of rights cannot be construed to disparage others. So uh, he's, he <laughs> says that your interpretation of the Fifth Amendment contradicts the Ninth because it's tried to stop it. Well, I think you're going to have to. You're going, to have, you're going to have to take this up with the framers. I mean, I can't resolve their contradictions. It's true. They say the, the, you know, the listing of some rights should not be construed as uh, disparaging or denying uh, other rights retained by the people. Uh, so why is the Fifth Amendment language there about uh, you can't take public prop uh, private property for public use without just compensation? It sounds like you can take private property for public use with just compensation. Why would you say that? <laughs> I can't straighten out all their contradictions. I'm afraid I'm going to have to plead, I don't know what, ignorance? 
<laughs> Definitely not the fifth. Um, Stefan uh, says, you know, he agrees. I'll play, I'll, play the fifth. I'll play the other. I'll okay. play the other part of the fifth. <laughs> um, uh, Elijah Stanfield asks, uh, let's see. Uh, did you go over any of the personal interests of George Washington that George Washington may have had in the formation of the federal government's power? Uh, I didn't go over personal interests. That that's a big subject. I, I would have talked long beyond what I did. Uh, you know, there were they, Jeff Washington was one of the major land speculators, uh, and uh, so, and many of the members of the, uh, the general convention uh, were speculators in government debt and wanted to make sure the debts would be paid, and uh, they felt that uh, the, a strong central government would be a better guarantee that the uh, the debts would be paid. You you do have a lot of interest going on there, but uh, no, I did not did not go into that. Uh, Wesley Matthew asks, uh, was the amendment process meant to be used whenever the government needed to expand its power rather than using judicial rulings? Well, what, what was it meant? Uh, that refers to individual minds, so different people probably meant different things. The uh, Madison and Jefferson and uh, Hamilton say things in the Federalist Papers that uh, strongly suggest. I mean, if it even it may even be explicit. I forget that I don't have the language handy. That uh, that the many uh, ambiguities would be worked out in the political realm, uh, and I don't think that necessarily means the amendment process. I think they knew there would be cases, there would be arguments between states and the federal government that would that would go to court, and the things, or there would be just political fights that would work these things out. They did not believe it was a finished document. It was intentionally vague in places. That it, was, it, was, it was a political document. It contained some compromise language. And the, 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 uh, na the uh, Federalists, who became the Federalists, uh, I think were confident that they would, uh, and they did rule for the first 10 years, that they would be able to establish a lot of precedents and, uh, and get their way on a lot of things. Now, some of the stuff was undone later when, uh, when the uh, Republicans get in, when Jefferson gets in. By the way, on this issue of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, there's just a quick anecdote about that. There's a funny story. You might wonder, why were the strong central government advocates called Federalists and the people that wanted a weak central government and strong states called Anti-Federalists? Well, it's because the people that, that we call Federalists had a great public relations uh, sense. They grabbed the words, the word very quickly. They knew it was a popular word. Uh, the dirty word was consolidated government. So they called themselves Federalists. And then they called their opponents anti-federalists. Now, this was put in perspective by Elbridge Gerry, who was an anti-federalist in Massachusetts during the ratification process, when he remarked about this and said, this is an odd use of terms. He said, we really should call people, we should really identify people by whether they're ratificationists or anti-ratificationists, or for short, the rats and the anti-rats. So I think that was the right spirit. In law so I'm an anti-rat. I always had to explain to people uh, that while I was the president of the Federalist Society, I was not by any stretch of the imagination a Federalist. Uh, George Marvin asks. Me, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to uh, say one more thing. I sound favorable to the Articles of Confederation. Uh, that was way too much government at the national level for me. And at the state level, you had pretty powerful governments doing all kinds of things, mercantilist sort of things and, and uh, giving grants and granting uh, corporate charters, uh, special favors, subsidies, uh, poor laws. Uh, th those were not libertarian by any stretch. And if you're an anarchist, of course, they were too much. Uh, so I'm just only uh, in comparison saying nice things about the Articles of Confederation. Not, I'm not making any absolute judgments about it. Uh, I am also leery of local power, uh, and we have to be sensitive to the idea that America's history, which uh, beginning with slavery and then through Jim Crow and all that rotten stuff, has tarnished otherwise uh, honorable concepts, and it, I think it hurts libertarians. Because, you know, when you, when you talk about decentralization, I don't like the term states' rights, but if you talk about decentralization, nullification, uh, you don't like the strong central government, some people don't hear that the way libertarians hear that because they remember the days of slavery. You know, some of the anti-federalists, certainly in the South, were afraid that a strong central government would break up slavery, would break the slave system, and they didn't like that. Some of the northern advocates of central, centralization had as maybe one of their purposes the breaking up of slavery. 
So breaking up of slavery is a good thing. But I generally don't like centralized power. So there is this sort of uh, tension there. I am not a fan of local tyranny. I, want, I wanted to make that clear. Anyway, go ahead. Go, let's go to the questioners. I, I think there's a tendency in a lot of libertarian time to romanticize things that lost out to big government, like uh, like the Confederacy and yeah. like uh, the Articles of the Confederation, and to pretend that they were more libertarian than they were. Uh, but, I mean, really, it's not that those things were good, it's that the things that won, the, the big government statism, was just terrible. Uh, uh, George Marvin asks, uh, so within the context of the Articles of Confederation, is there anything equivalent to the Bill of Rights on behalf of the individual? Uh, well, there was no Bill of Rights. The states uh, had Bill of Rights. And one reason uh, pe some people in the states demanded a Bill of Rights added, be added to the Constitution was that, that they had them in their state constitutions, and they just wondered, hey, don't, have, don't constitutions have Bills of Rights? And, you know, how... Hamilton's answer was, well, you don't need a Bill of Rights. If, if the government can only do what's uh, the powers, you know, uh, exercise the powers delegated to it, then uh, it can't uh, do anything else and therefore can't violate rights. That wasn't satisfactory to a lot of people. So the, uh, I don't think anyone called for a Bill of Rights on the part of the national government under the Articles because may, maybe it's because there was just so little power. Maybe someone was calling for it and I'm not aware of it. But there was much more focus on the states in those days because... The, the, the national government was so bare bones. Uh, Wesley Matthew asks, uh, how much strength or influence did the Constitution give the judicial branch compared to the Articles of Confederation? I think under the Articles there were some judicial powers uh, uh, that, that were exercised by the Congress in, uh, for disputes between states and possibly between the citizens, uh, you know, of different states. Uh, no, the, the major judiciary was, was state, was state judiciary. There was not a separate, just like there was not a separate executive branch under the Articles, there was not a separate uh, judicial branch. I'm not hearing you, Matt, but I can read it. Yeah, would we have been far better off with our Articles of Confederation had been maintained and the Constitution had not been adopted. Well, this gets to the point I was making earlier. Uh, it's a mixed, you know, local... The only thing I can really say in favor of, of uh, local government or decentralized government is that the cost of voting with your feet is brought down considerably if, if the government is at the state or even lower level, right? It's cheaper to move from a town to another town or from a state to a state, uh, even in those days, than it would be to leave the country. So the only advantage I can really think of, of, of decentralization is, is that exit is cheaper. That's a, good, that's a good thing. Because that, to some extent, puts some pressure on the, on the jurisdictions. If, you know, if, 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 if they raise taxes too much <coughs> and people and businesses start to leave, that, that may exercise some, uh, cause them to exercise some restraint and say, well, we'll look at the outflow of, uh, of people and businesses. Maybe, uh, maybe our taxes is too high. So there might be a competition, a race to the bottom as far as regulation and any, any intervention uh, is concerned. In the case, I'm not obviously speaking of, uh, uh, of some libertarian situation, but just your, your typical you know, local and state government. Uh, on the other hand, the danger is that uh, there's no sort of higher power, like a national government, to, uh, to uh, come in and, uh, say, strike down uh, Jim Crow laws or black, or black codes. Uh, so local governments or state governments may get away with stuff uh, that I don't like. Uh, slavery would be the most uh, glaring example. So, you know, as long as I think this goes to really to maybe to the anarchist, ultimate anarchist argument, as long as there's government existing at any level, there's danger. And uh, that's the key issue, not exactly what level it is. Although, like I say, there's some advantages to having it more local because it's cheaper to escape. Last week I was actually looking at a, a left anarchist blog, which is not usually where I look for pearls of wisdom, but I think they, they put it very well. You know, exit is a great thing, but it's not 
your first option. It's by, if, out of necessity. It's it's kind of the the last resort. Uh, Wesley Matthew asks. Uh, was the creation of an independent federal judiciary an expansion or a check on centralized? Uh, in some cases, it was uh, one. In some cases, it was the other. I mean, the, 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 obviously, you can find uh, cases where the, the uh, courts have struck down uh, laws that libertarians were glad to see get struck down, but, uh, but all too often they have affirmed bad stuff. Certainly in the national security area, the, the federal courts have... Uh, essentially rolled over. There are a few exceptions, but uh, too often in things like that, the, uh, and in other areas, the federal, the federal courts have said, uh, we don't want to get between the two political branches. This is for the two political branches to work out, so we, we're staying out of it. So it's mixed. It's a mixed story, like most things. Most things are complicated, so is that. Yeah, I, I think my theory is not coming there. So, you, know, you have the, the Lochner versus New York case decided by the Supreme Court, right? find that uh, the liberty of contract is uh, is implicit in the due process clause. And then you have uh, not, what, 20 years, 30 years later, um, you have, uh, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I forgot the name out of the guy growing his own uh, yeah, his own that, wheat. Yeah, Wicked v. Filburn. Wicked v. Filburn, yeah. Wicker, Wicker v. Filburn. Uh, Wicker v. Filburn. yeah. Well, let's keep in mind, though, that it's, it's, the Lochner case grows out of a state law, though, in New York, not out of a federal law. So they weren't striking, they weren't limiting federal power in Lochner. They were limiting state power. So that that's a mixed blessing. I mean, on the one hand, I was, you know, it's a good thing Lochner fell, but it also meant the federal courts now were uh, not, maybe it wasn't the first time, perhaps, but could reach into the states. Uh, Madison wanted a provision in the Constitution that would let the Congress strike down state laws. He couldn't get it, but he wanted it. Yeah, the, the enemy of my enemy may be useful, but he's not necessarily my friend. Either uh, way, there are dangers. This is, one of, this is one of the, I think, one of the anarchist arguments. Either way, there are dangers. Uh, Herman Morris asked, how was public service addressed by the framers uh, in terms of compensation, full-time versus part-time, etc.? Oh, I guess I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, so I'm going to have to I'll have to uh, duck that one. <laughs> it's not something I've taken a close look at. Sorry. Uh, we'll make a last call for questions here, but uh, I want to let, let everyone know that Sheldon is coming back uh, next week to do another talk on the American founding. Uh, the subtitle for that one is Empire on Their Minds, so you kind of have an idea of where he's going with that. Uh, Sheldon, would you like to give us just a, a little, I don't know, 60 second preview of what you're, you're going to be covering? Sure. I'm, I'm going to take a look at the, the thinking of uh, some important uh, founders and, you know, important figures in the early years of the, of the Republic and even, even pre-revolution, uh, indicating that uh, the idea of establishing a new empire in the, in the new world uh, was on their minds. Uh, I'm not saying it was on everybody's mind in the country, but certainly the principles, and there was a lot of a great deal of support for it among the people. I kind of mentioned this earlier when I said that the conservatives, as the revolution was coming on, or as it was on, were thinking of the revolution, in, at least in part, important part, as a as a battle between a mature empire and a new rising empire in the, in the new world, what what what, Jeff, what Washington called the infant empire. Uh, so I want to show that that was a widespread view, and that the idea that uh, that the U.S. Uh, the, the founding was anti-empire is not true. It was anti-British empire, but that's not the same as anti-empire. Thank you so much for uh, for talking to us tonight. I'm definitely looking forward to next week. This has been really great.